Good morning, everybody. This is Victoria, your dog guru, and we are covering another episode of Coffee and Canines today. This is a segment where I answer the questions that you guys have sent in and try and give you the best advice that I can. So let's hop into it. First one comes from Judge Brian, no specific location noted, and he wants to know what's the oldest you can train a dog. Truthfully, there is no age limit. There are periods and stages in life that are easier to train in than others, like imprint periods, which happen from birth to eight weeks, and then from eight weeks to 15 or 16. But just because a dog is a senior dog doesn't mean that they can't actually be trained. After working with several age ranges of dogs, obviously it's easier to reach them when they're younger, but that's just because of those imprint periods. Once you're out of those imprint periods, the work is almost the same. Now, the amount of repetition can vary. So like with a dog that's completely green, has no previous training, and you're working with a, like a clean slate, that can be a lot easier. But when you're dealing with an older dog, they've already established habits. In fact, if they're 14, 15 years old, it's going to be very difficult to reverse those habits, but it's not impossible. Positive reinforcement is an excellent way of reaching a dog because it's rewarding the right behavior, it's non-invasive. So that's a great way to reach your dog. The thing about older dogs is they're not as emotionally sensitive, but they are defensive. What I mean by that is, it's not that they can't be trained, it's that they're gonna have a resistance to a new protocol because while they're established emotionally, they have also gotten a routine going that they're pretty cool with, whether that's destroying things or digging out of yards and what have you. And actually, it looks like we have another question where we'll address exactly that, you know, dogs digging out of yards. I think we should think about it a different way, though. Let's not think about it as dogs that are old are harder to train, because honestly, in my experience, they're not. They're already emotionally invested with their owners. They're typically really responsive when they're given a new routine. And you kind of just have to figure out what it is they want. Appeal to their greed. You'll hear me say this a lot. And that doesn't, you know, for us, it's monetary or it's an emotional payoff. For them, it can be food, it can be playtime, it can be time away from training. Um, you know, older dogs especially, they work, I always work them in short segments. Not too long, you don't want them to lose interest. They're already in their golden years, so let's not be invasive. But if you did, you know, five three-minute segments a day, you're still getting the reinforcement there. And for older dogs, shorter periods of time, just like brand new puppies, is the best way to work, in my opinion. The goal is not to flood them and overrun them with information. It's just to present new information that will be useful. With older dogs, I think the biggest consideration is the fact that they aren't going to want to latch onto a new plan necessarily as quickly or easily as a younger dog. Is it an impossible mountain to climb? No, it's not. It just takes more time and it takes the right direction. But like with anything else, when you're learning new skill, practice makes perfect. Think of that as if you were your dog. Your dog isn't going to figure it all out in the course of a week. I mean, you might have that one in one million because they're out there. But generally, a new technique takes, especially a series of new techniques, like basic obedience where your dog has never been ha in a position to learn basic obedience, that's going to take a while. It's going to take at least a month. And I mean, sometimes longer, depending on how resistant they are, how motivated they are, what level of trust you guys have together, and what le level of motivation you're utilizing. In my opinion, fear is not the way to reach a dog. For that matter, I don't believe pain is a motivator for dogs. So for me, the road may take a little longer, but the establishment of behavior is also stronger. And prevalent in the dog's mind. You, you just don't want to be in a position where you're trying to work away from something bad by teaching something scary. I know there's other methodology out there. I just don't prefer it because I feel like in the past 15 years, I've never needed to utilize an alternative methodology to reach my dog, to reach my client, 
to reach a rescue. And it doesn't matter what age they are. But if you use something that's really abrasive to a really young dog or a really old dog or really just any dog, they're going to be resistant. Motivating through fear, whether it's humans or dogs, is just not the way to get from point A to point B. So be realistic. So my best advice when you're trying to reach an older dog is short segments often. Also, you want a gradual build. You don't want to overwhelm them, uh, as I mentioned before. But, you know, if you do segments of three minutes a couple of times a day or a handful of times a day, depending on what you're trying to convey, that's going to be sufficient reinforcement. But if an older dog feels inundated with new information, it's like you learning Google for the first time and all the technology that Google has, algorithms, you know, SEO, just all things Google that you didn't really know were part of the Google process because you just type in your question and an answer pops up. For your dog, if you overwhelm them with information, that same thing is going to happen. They're going to be like, it's not going to get stored. They're just going to shut down or they're going to walk away, which is super common for older dogs because they know how to work you. So simplicity is really where you're going to win. Don't make it difficult. Just make it clear. Make it a regular occurrence and don't overdo it. Eli from Anchorage, Alaska asked, how do I stop my dog from escaping the yard when I'm at work? That's actually kind of a big question. First of all, you have to make sure that the dog's needs are being met. Is he getting enough exercise when you're home? Is he getting enough one-on-one from you when you're home? And does he have anything to do when you're gone? There's a number of reasons that dogs dig, and I'll list a few of them off. So the first one is digging because it's cooler in the ground than it is on the surface where they're standing. Another is boredom. Another is to hide specific objects or things that they value. Another is attempting to break free of an environment, which there are several factors there. But you need to figure out what it is that your dog is digging for. I understand he's escaping the yard, but are all of his emotional and physical needs being met? What is it that he gets when he bails out of the yard? Is he running to a neighbor? Is he going off and digging holes elsewhere? Probably not. It's more than likely that he's trotting around a vicinity or a neighborhood where he's like, do, 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 do. My reason for saying all of this is containment isn't enough. You can strap a dog into an environment, but that actually doesn't mean that when given the opportunity, they wouldn't bust out again. There's a couple of reasons for this. The first is it's a self-rewarding behavior. So once they get free of the yard, then they can go gallivanting all over. And there's no one to tell them no. There's no one to create a boundary. So they're just free birds. The other reason and most common reason I'll see outside of entertainment value is the desire to use their natural instincts. If on a daily basis, you don't let your dog experience the world it lives in, it's going to get cabin fever. And eventually, if he can't get out, he might try self-mutilation or destruction of property. Like there's, so this is where I'm going to tell you, let your dog be a dog. Make sure that when you're out on a walk, they're not just going to heal the entire time. Now that goes against what a trainer would tell you. And I'm a trainer. But what I used to tell my clients is, would you want to go out on a walk where you had to be militant in your behavior the entire time? No. No, you wouldn't. You'd be like, no, (laughs) go get your energy out with someone else. I don't want to run six miles and recite the Declaration of Independence. No, you wouldn't. You, You would look for an easier way out. Even better if there's nobody to tell you off and, you know, monitor you, which... That's really one of the things that you need to key into. Why is your dog doing this? What's the motivation behind it? Does he have enough to keep him busy throughout the day? I always recommend not to leave your dog in a yard. My main cornerstone reason for feeling that way is it's easy for people to interfere with your dog, say enter the yard without your say-so. It's easy for the dog to try and find an escape route, even if it's time consuming. And heaven forbid someone doesn't like your dog, they can do bad things when you're not present and you could end up without a dog. I'm not trying to be morbid here, but the reality is, is not everybody is going to be as big a fan of your dog as you are. So if he's barking all day long and you're not here to hear it, 
and cor- you know correct it and redirect it into something he is allowed to do, a different way to express himself, he's going to run in circles because there's no direction. There's no compass in the storm. You need to be that compass. That doesn't mean you are ever forceful. I want to really, really drive that home is, you know, you can get every result you want out of your dog without being forceful. You just have to have that level of consistency. You have to appeal to their greed by motivating them either by affection or food or toys or access somewhere they don't normally get to go, safe places. You know, you have to figure out who your dog is. And every dog is a little different. If a client were to approach me and say, my dog is bailing out at the yard on a regular basis, I would ask two things at the forefront of that conversation. The first would be, how often do you take him for a walk? More often than not, the answer was, oh, a couple times a week. Okay, so when you go on your walks, how far are you going? Oh, we go around the block. Well, let me tell you something about your dog. If he is running three miles in your absence, that's kind of what he needs in his daily life. He needs an outlet for his instincts, where he can use his nose, where he can investigate things, where he can have exposure to different environments, different types of people, different animals, all of those things. Because when you're not around and he's bailing out of that yard, that's really what he's looking for entertainment, a way to use his natural, God-given instincts. Our last question comes from Miriam Wells in Stephenville, Texas. So Miriam wants to know, what is it that I avoid as a dog owner? Ooh, getting personal. (laughs) No, just kidding. Um, There's actually a handful of things I avoid as a dog owner. The first thing that comes to mind is actually probably going to surprise a lot of people, and that's dog parks. The reason I don't bring my dogs to dog parks is not that it would be a problem for them as individuals, but it's more of a problem for me. When when people's dogs kind of descend onto mine because they haven't trained their dog or their dog is super dominant or just naturally defensive or even territorial, which I very rarely see in dog parks, but you know, given an hour at a dog park, a dog might become defensive of that area and assume it's theirs. So for that reason and a handful of other reasons, for me, dog parks are no-go. My dogs are exceptionally well-trained. They will always respond the way I ask them to respond because we have a great relationship. I've always used positive reinforcement to get what I wanted and to make sure that they were safe. But unfortunately, a lot of people that will show up to a dog park don't do that same level of training. And as a result, good dogs can end up with bad memories. The other reason I stay away from dog parks is a lot of people don't obey the general rules like the size restrictions and things like that. And that can be a problem. You know, I have a small dog and a large dog. And if I were to bring my small dog to the large dog's side, he could look like kibbles and bits to a larger dog that has a strong prey drive. And before you know it, he's pinned on his side with a dog on his neck. And it doesn't mean the other dog was evil. It just means that he didn't belong there in the first place. The larger dog, honestly, or mine. A big reason why I stopped bringing dogs to dog parks was in large part that people weren't adhering to the rules that were set out. And because there's nobody to moderate the environment beyond an individual saying, you know, your dog is blank, 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 if you can even find the owner, that was a huge trigger for me. I don't want my dog to be under siege because this is the first time this giant dog has ever been exposed to other dogs. Oh, and by the way, he's bitten the neighbor's dog, which you'll only hear about when they're exiting the dog park. So for me, the thing that I avoid most are dog parks. Do I expose my dog to foreign environments? Yeah, they're service animals. They go everywhere and they know how to behave in those varied environments. And as a result of that, they know they can trust me not to expose them somewhere where they would be at risk. So that's one of the reasons I avoid dog parks. I think it was a great concept. I just feel like in practice, it's not as fantastic as the idea on the surface. Now, you may never run into problems with the dog park. If you go on a regular basis, though, I find that really unlikely. Even if your dog is nice, you might be exposing your dog to another that is not nice. And now you've taken away the element of control you get from a a leash, the guidance and feedback you'd get from an owner who could be just on their cell phones. You know, for all you know, they're not even inside the fenced in area. And I've had that happen. That's why I bring that up. 
The other thing that I do whenever I see a dog off leash in either my subdivision or perhaps we have we're out on a training expedition, as we can call it, where we're working with another dog who's probably green in whatever area we're practicing. Anytime I see an off leash dog, I immediately get out. I get out of Dodge because while whoever it is that has their dog off leash thinks that the dog is under control, I can tell you as somebody who has studied behavior, you never know what your dog's trigger is going to be. It could be the first time in their entire lives that you've ever seen some sort of defensive, you know, aggressive reactive or dominant behavior, but every dog has the ability to express such behavior. So I think the big problem for me is I I look at everything almost like it's a free radical. You know, if I, if I can conceive it happening, then it probably can happen. And for the same reasons that I wouldn't leave my dogs to inherit a new fear I remove them whenever I see a dog off leash. I will literally walk as quickly as I can in the other direction without drawing attention to ourselves. And it's not that my dog would handle it poorly. It's that I don't know what that other dog is going to do. So as my dog's first line of defense, I take them out of the mix. It's not that they would make the wrong call. It's more of a fear of, I don't know your dog. I don't know what they've done. For all I know, they don't like fluffy animals. And I don't want to find that out the hard way. So for those reasons, anytime I see a dog off leash, I just get out of Dodge. I I completely evacuate and abandon whatever my plan was at the time. Because now it's about controlling and safety and management. And part of my role as their trainer or as their handler is to make sure that if I see something that would send a red flag to me that I get them out of there. I don't just willy-nilly assume that they're going to make all the right choices because they've been well-trained. Because even if they make all the right choices, that doesn't mean that they're not going to become prey for another dog. Be an advocate for your dog. I really want to emphasize that out of anything that I'm saying today. Be an advocate for your dog. They don't have the same voice that you do. They're not as articulate as we are able to be. So if you feel like something doesn't give you the warm and fuzzy feeling, then be their advocate, get them out of there, reward them for not reacting, and then move forward. Thank you guys for your questions. I actually have an announcement. We are offering 20 minutes of one-on-one with me for 20 bucks. This is a way lower rate than we typically offer. And I know a lot of you have joined us on the webinars and enjoyed the information and feedback you've gotten. But if you have a complex situation or even an easy situation and you just need answers from a professional, then you can actually find this link and schedule it right from your home. I'm going to include it in the show notes so that you have somebody who's informed that can really address what you personally are dealing with. Also, if you haven't already, share us with your friends, rate us on iTunes. I always include that information in the show notes. And please like our Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash dog guru podcast. And you can always comment there, share there, send us your photos there. And if you're interested in talking with me on our show on air, I would be happy to have you just kind of give me a little bit of a bio of you and your dog and the situation you're dealing with. And you might end up on the show on our Facebook page right now. We're polling everybody to know what they want to hear next. So this is a great place to weigh in. And if none of those answers apply to you and you have something else that you want addressed in our series, just let us know. Send us a message. We're here to listen. Making sure our audience feels that the content is relevant to them is very important to us. I want to thank everybody who's contributed to the show from your emails to your comments to your interviews. I appreciate all of you and I'm so glad that this is growing. Also, please subscribe to our podcast so this way you can hear all the latest and greatest episodes. We'll actually be building some exclusive content over the next month or two. So if you want to be one of our VIP members, just make sure you're subscribed because they're going to be the first ones to know about it. And that's it for me, everybody. I hope you're having a great day. This has been Victoria, your dog guru. Namaste.